Welcome back to the OSM channel. This is my buddy's dump trailer. I think it's from probably around 2005. Looked at the manufacturer's plate. It's only rated for 9,000 pounds, but let me tell you, this thing's built like a tank. Anyway, I've been doing a lot of construction work with him in the city lately, and uh, we have another big job coming up soon. And we have to move a scissor lift from one job to another, and we're gonna move that scissor lift with this dump trailer. However, it needs a little bit of TLC. So in today's video, we're gonna do some maintenance on it. Get it road worthy. All right, so the first thing we need to replace on this trailer is this square post jack. Now, what's wrong with the old one? Well, for one, it's missing the handle, nowhere to be found. Two, missing the greaser, not the end of the world. And three, it's missing the skid plate on the bottom of the jack. And that skid plate is actually pretty important. If you're towing this big trailer with a small truck and you go over a, uh, a little hill or a low clearance area pulling in and out of a gas station, that skid will allow you to skid over the pavement rather than the post digging in the ground. So that's pretty important. And I've been looking at this for a while, and initially I thought, well, shoot, we're going to have to cut this off the frame, and there's a lot of weld on there. That would take some time. But after playing around with this jack for a little while, I determined that this is actually the same profile as this new replacement square post jack that I purchased. So we're actually going to be able to replace the internal components uh, with the new jack onto the old jack here, so that's going to save us a lot of work. So the first thing we need to do is to remove this bolt that would connect the stem to the crank handle, which I've already loosened that up. Slide this post, this inner post out of the outer post. You can see there's the internal guts of the jack right there. A little while since those threads have been greased. Now before I install the new one internals from this Kurt jack, Let's see if we can put a grease circ in here. Well, the grease circ isn't gonna happen right now. All the grease circs I have are metric and I actually don't have any metric taps. So I'll have to get those at some point. But anyway, let's pull the internal guts out. So I've already removed the bracket that connects again the stem to the crank rod. And we can just simply slide this out. bracket on there and there is a washer that goes up here we'll put that washer on there bracket and the bolt I tell you that is so much easier than having to cut that whole thing off so I got lucky here so small issue with this jacking handle it seems to me like they typically punch this steel and it's supposed to expand out and once you tighten down this bolt it's supposed to prevent it from sliding through this bracket. However, I purchased this Kurt Jack through Amazon second hand on Amazon which means somebody purchased it, they sent it back, and then it's up for sale again. You normally can find great deals on items like this but sometimes they need a little bit of tweaking. For example, in this case, Looks like I'm gonna have to weld a little washer on the end of this to prevent this handle from sliding out. But I got a welder, no big deal. I'd say that's a pretty nice looking plug weld for welding with flux corded wire. Just gotta be careful I don't burn my fingers off. There. I think that fixed the problem. Awesome. So next thing I want to do is take a look at the bearings and the brakes. So in order to do that, we're going to have to jack up one side of the trailer at a time. I'm gonna try jacking on the equalizer here. It's probably not approved, but it'd be nice if I could get both these tires off the ground in one shot here. Both tires coming off, off the ground at the same time. And of course, whenever you jack something up, you don't wanna depend on that pump jack. Always put some jack stands on either side of the area that you're working on. So I have a jack stand positioned underneath the frame there. And another one positioned underneath the frame here. So now that we have the trailer tires jacked up off the ground, what I like to do, I like to grab the tire on either side and rock it from side to side. Now there's a castle nut in here and there's a preload set on that castle nut. So basically that castle nut controls how tight the bearings are to the trailer axle. In this case, there's just a little bit more free play than I would like. 
So what we're gonna have to do, we're gonna have to remove this grease cap and we're gonna have to tighten up that castle nut slightly. Additionally, I see that there's rubber caps right here, so it does look like there's probably gonna be a grease zerk in here. We will just have to grease up the axle bearings. Now, another thing I like to do, I like to spin the tires and listen to hear what's going on. So that sound sounds like a little bit of drag on the brakes, but there's really not much drag. I would like to adjust these brakes. So I'm gonna show you how to do that too. First thing we gotta do those, pop off the tire. Now let's pop this dust cap off. So the way I like to do this, I like to take a hammer and gently strike it. But when I strike, I don't strike straight down. I try to come back. You can see it's starting to move a little bit. Just gentle strikes. I mean, this probably should be replaced, but I feel like most of us are just gonna reuse it. There we go. Let me wipe some of the grease out of here to give you guys an idea as to what's going on here. So we have a castle nut in here. And it's called a castle nut because it literally looks like a castle. And we also have a grease zerk right here. So this is how we're gonna grease our bearings. And what prevents this castle nut from backing off? You can see it's actually a little loose right now. There's a simple cotter pin that goes through the peaks on the castle nut. So in order to adjust the preload on these trailer bearings, first thing we need to do is remove this cotter pin. And then from there, we can tighten up the castle nut and check it for rock. Typically what I like to do, I like to get this castle nut really tight, crank it down nice and tight, and then I back it off uh, a little bit just so that uh, it's definitely tighter than this, but it's, it's kind of a balance. You don't want to make it too tight, but you don't want to make it too loose. Now, you're not always going to have the cotter pins to prevent the castle nut from backing off. In this case, there are these tabs that simply fold up and lock into the channels of the uh, castle nut. So I folded it down. Now I'm going to take my channel locks and just tighten this castle nut real tight, back it off a little bit, and we'll fold this tab up. Get it nice and tight, spin it a little bit. Starting to feel some resistance now. now I'm gonna back this off. Just like an eighth turn. And I'm happy with that. I'm gonna take this little tab right here, fold it back up into the castle nut. Now that castle nut is not gonna back off. Also, while that dust cap is off, we might as well grease the bearings. Now, typically when I inject grease into a grease zerk, I like to see grease spill out uh, the edges of that joint. However, in this case, I probably made 20 pumps and I didn't see anything really come out of here. There's a little bit coming out right there, so I, I think that's just fine. Anyway, we can reinstall this dust cap now. Should actually make sure the edge of this is clean. But to reinstall this dust cap, simply tap it back on. All right, so you're looking at the back side of the brake drum here. This is what I would describe as the dust shield. Now there's this little, it's kind of like a nylon cover uh, that's typically in the back of these dust shields. And I popped that out with a flathead screwdriver. And what you're gonna need to adjust the brakes now is a brake adjustment tool, or in my case, I took an old stainless steel knife and bent it up uh, to make it work for this purpose. So you simply take your tool, insert it in the slot, and there's basically like a little gear thing in there. And what you're trying to do, if you're trying to make the brakes tighter, what you're gonna wanna do is flip that gear up typically so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna sneak this tool down in here and I'm gonna push up. And you heard that pop, so that was that gear uh, spinning, which in turn extends a rod, right? So there's pads inside this brake. So as we spin that little gear, it extends 
the shoes out and therefore they get closer to the drum. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep flipping this up and keep spinning the drum and basically you want it to the point where there's just a slight amount of drag. starting to feel where there's a little bit of drag. You can hear it getting a little bit noisier. So now there's just a little bit of drag on those brake pads. So when I spin this, you can see it doesn't spin very long. That's about where you want it. Typically there is a spot in the dust shield where you can inspect the brake pads to ensure that there's pad on there. In this case, I can see on this little side right here and I do see that there is pad on the brake shoes. So that's fine, we're not worried about that. So I'm gonna repeat the process on the other three axles and then I'll get back with you when we figure out what we're gonna do next, maybe wiring. Just finished up with the axles and brakes. We properly adjusted the preload on all those bearings and adjusted the brakes so everything's looking good there. Next thing I wanna do is I wanna install these orange markers on the back corners of the trailer. Now back when I used to snow plow, I had a company reach out to me back then called Winter Equipment and they sent me out these markers. These markers are unlike your traditional orange fluorescent markers in that Winter Equipment has installed a steel cable inside these markers. Traditionally with the orange hollow markers, they don't last. Uh, what happens, sometimes water gets in there or they get very brittle when it gets cold out. But these with the steel core in there, I mean, you could whack, you could slam these, do whatever you want and they're just not gonna break. So if you're into snow plowing, definitely check out winter equipment and their snow plow markers. Anyway, you can get these mounted up on the back corners of the trailer now. So next thing I want to address is this tailgate. In order to load a scissor lift in this trailer, you have to completely remove this tailgate. You have to lift it off, put it somewhere else, it's a pain in the neck. Probably weighs 80 to 100 pounds and I'm a little pip squeak guy so it's a lot of weight for me. Anyway, there's nothing good to grab onto this tailgate. So I have some horseshoes laying around, I'm just going to weld these onto the top rail on the tailgate so that way when you need to lift this onto the trailer you have something to better hold on to it. It's just going to make it easier to take this thing on and off. So let's weld this up. Next thing we need to address on this trailer are these non-functioning taillights. Both the driver's side and the passenger side taillights are no longer functioning. Now these are the older halogen bulb style housings and I'm just gonna do away with them and replace them with these LED housings, which these are very cheap. They're like 15 or $20 for a pair on Amazon. They're brighter. And the only thing that really could go wrong with those aside from a wire issue would be you get a corroded ground and you just have to clean up that ground over time. So anyway, I have the seven pin trailer connector connected to my truck right now. And I also have my power probe connected to the battery on my truck. So the power probe is powered up. So typically these light fixtures ground themselves to the trailer from these two lugs in the back. So if I put this power probe over these lug, also I have my four ways on right now. So we're getting ground and then a little bit of power. So to me, it seems like we're getting power back to the light housing. However, either the bulb shot or we have some type of internal issue, but it does appear that we have a decent ground right here, so. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna shut off my four ways, then we'll remove this fixture. And then I forget, so there's a green and yellow wire. Those are your left turn and right turn, not sure which side goes to which. 
once we remove this we will find out and then you also have your brown which your brown is your running light if I'm not mistaken your parking lights so anyway let's remove this and we'll get the power probe out test each individual wire, individual wire to ensure that we're getting power to the appropriate wire if we are then we're just going to swap this out to the LED taillight housing so now I have my parking lights on and I also have my hazards back on. I have removed this fixture from the mount. Now this is no longer grounded, so in order to ground this, I would simply take my alligator clip grounding connection on my power probe and put it on one of these terminals. Now we are getting flashing. So this is the passenger side. So it's in fact the green wire that is our signaling wire. I see that the wire does have some damage right there, but if I take my power probe and stick it on the green wire, we are getting power there. And then the brown wire should also have power because that is our parking light. We're getting a constant 12 volts. So that's good, that tells me that we are getting power back to the turn signal as well as the parking light. So we probably have two issues that were wrong with this fixture for one we probably had a bad ground and then the second issue it seems like the parking light filament in this bulb has burnt out so we're just going to swap it over to led and then we shouldn't have a problem for a very long time we just got to make sure we clean this up where the led light fixture connects to this mount to ensure we have a nice clean strong ground Now I'm going to share with you how I like to connect my wires together. Now, traditionally in the past, when you wanted to make a proper soldered connection between wires, what you would have to do, you'd have to slide a piece of heat shrink over the wire, strip the end of the wire, twist the copper with the other wire that you want to connect together, solder that connection, then slide the heat shrink back over, and uh, heat up the heat shrink to shrink that back down, and then you'd have a really good connection. Well, now they make these all-in-one heat shrink sleeves with a dab of low temperature solder in the middle. So this makes it extremely simple and quick to make a really stout connection. So I have that connector slid over my green and brown wire. So I'll take the green, take the other green, and I like to overlap them in the middle and then just twist them together. Get a few rotations going here something like that and I'm gonna slide this heat shrink and low temperature solder connector over the wire from here it's probably better to take a uh, little heat gun and heat this up slowly but I typically use a butane torch so we're gonna slowly heat up this connector and watch that solder you'll see it'll eventually get to its melting point and then uh, melt therefore fusing the two copper wires together and then the heat shrink is just gonna seal everything up. The blue is actually glue, so that really seals up this end and this end, and you just have a really stout connection. Do this slowly if you can. Spread that heat out. Try not to burn the wire. You can see I burnt the wire just a little bit right there. Didn't burn through, so I'm not worried about it. Focus that heat right on that solder. Come from multiple directions. I see the solder starting to run now. And we'll finish shrinking down the heat shrink. And that is a really stout connection. So with these cheap trailer tail lights, they actually include their own grounding connection. So I took a flap disc, ground out, ground off some of the paint and schmutz so we have a nice clean shiny metal surface for a good ground. Uh, the studs right here added that connector underneath the flat washer, tightened up the nuts. We have a solid connection between our brown and green wires. So before we clean that up, let's turn on the parking lights as well as the hazard lights and ensure that this side functions properly. It's not working. Interesting, so the light is not coming on. We verified that we had good power coming into the green as well as the brown wire. So I have a feeling we have a ground issue. Now when I take the grounding alligator clip on the power probe and connect it to the stud on the back of this light fixture, sure enough, the light comes on just fine. 
So I suspect we have an issue with the main ground for the trailer and that's up front. So let's go address that. So we're at the trailer hitch of the trailer and if you look down here, see that white wire? Well, that is the main ground for the trailer and you can see it's a bit corroded, it's not in terrific shape and we need to address that. I strongly believe that is why that light is not coming on. There's not a sufficient ground to allow for that circuit to complete. So let's remove this and see if we can improve this. Wow. That's pretty bad. A lot of rust and corrosion in there. No wonder why we were having an issue. So I've drilled a hole through the frame this time, ground off the paint and rust, and I have a little bit of uh, dielectric grease. So this time, what we're gonna do as opposed to a self-tapping screw is we're actually gonna utilize a stainless steel bolt. This is gonna come up through the hole in the frame like so. Put this connector down. I intentionally left a little bit of copper overhanging the connector there. You're out of focus for some reason. Yeah, but I intentionally left that copper overhanging so that way it could make direct contact with the flat washer that we're going to put over this. A little bit more dielectric grease doesn't hurt. <clears throat> Much better than what we had before. Now I do need to secure this ground wire to the frame here, but before we do that, let's go to the back and ensure that the taillight is functioning properly now, which it should be. We still have an issue here. Hmm. Still not getting a good ground back here for some reason. So unfortunately, I still don't have a good ground for that rear tail light. And what I'm thinking it might be now, it might be the seven pin trailer plug. Like I'm looking at this and it's not really corroded, but it's a little bit dirty. So I have a small flat file. I'm just gonna file up these terminals a little bit, try and get a better connection between the truck and trailer. Uh, I'll try that off camera. If that doesn't fix it, I'm actually going to open up this plug and we'll see if anything's going on in here. So I think I found the problem this time. Opened up the trailer connector, seven pin trailer connector. Look at all the corrosion on all the terminals. And that corrosion just reduces the current that's able to pass through the wire. So yeah, stuff like this gets a bit tricky because you think you're getting a good ground. So what could be the problem? Well, in this case, I think it's a current issue. Just not getting enough juice back to the light. So I'm gonna see if I have a new seven pin trailer connector. If not, then uh, I'll have to order one. Just finished up with the new connector. Put a lot of dielectric grease on there. Have some nice clean new contacts. So I'm gonna put this back together and then we'll try it again. All right, we're chasing down a demon here. So I removed the passenger side rear tail light, put the power probe on the frame, and we're getting 12 volts. So that, to me, seems like we have some type of short somewhere. I do have the truck running right now. I thought, well, maybe it just wasn't getting enough juice, but yeah, we should not be getting 14 volts on the frame right now. So we definitely have a short somewhere. So let me shut off the truck and try and track down this wire. All right, so I'm pretty sure I found the shorting wire. So this is the trailer breakaway device. So say your trailer hitch breaks and the chains break, the final thing that would give way would be this breakaway wire. It would pull this pin out of the device. There's 12 volts going in here, and there's 12 volts that would be going out if you pull this pin. This is normally open, but once you pull this pin out of here, it closes, closes the circuit, and it sends power to the trailer brakes, therefore applying the trailer brakes. Now, this is a dump trailer, so it normally has a deep cycle battery, so that deep cycle battery 
uh, will always provide 12 volts to this unit. However, if you have a trailer over 3,500 pounds that does not have a deep cycle battery, it is required to have a small little battery pack for that breakaway device. But anyway, if I bring you in closer down here, adjust the contrast a little bit, you could see where they ran these wires through the frame here. Through this little hole right here, which is really for the breakaway chains. And you see that corrosion right there? Yeah, I believe that's a short right there. I did order a new breakaway kit. It's not here yet, so I'm just going to clip these wires off and we'll give it another test. That wire was rubbing right on the frame. So let's try tapping the power probe on the frame. And we are still getting 12 volts on the frame. So it seems like we have another grounded out wire somewhere. We keep tracking down where this next issue may be. We're definitely getting closer to figuring this out. So I had the running lights on for a moment a second ago. And this right light came on, and this is the first time this has been on, so I think it's possible that the wire that passes through the frame for this ID bar may be shorting out on the frame, or something else within this ID bar is shorting out. So let's remove this and see if we find anything. So we have a very corroded connection, but where this wire passes through the frame, I wouldn't say that I see any grounding. I'll tell you right now. Yeah, so it doesn't appear to have grounded out to the frame. I don't know. So this is turning into quite the nightmare. So I pulled back some of the wire loom and this yellow wire. I don't know. It's all messed up. So here's the latest update on this trailer. It's been about two and a half days since I worked on the trailer. Last time I shut off the camera, I ended up working on this trailer until about 10 o'clock at night. And I had to replace most of the wiring harness. Although we were able to find and address several other issues like the shorts, bad ground, corroded connector, so on and so forth. Even after I corrected all that with the original wiring harness, I still wasn't getting the current necessary to properly operate the rear taillights. Now this trailer is from 2001 and we live in the northeast here so I'm sure this trailer was ran in the salt and let me show you this blue wire. So this is your trailer brake wire. Look at that copper. See how it's kind of black? So that tells me that corrosion has got into the wiring. Now the trailer manufacturer didn't do a terrific job at protecting these wires from the elements and eventually somehow some corrosive elements got in here and degraded the copper. Another thing I hate to see is these connectors right here. So if you take a look at that connector, my autofocus is uh, acting up a little bit, but look at the black wire. So this, this gets bridged to the trailer brake wire and this black wire will go back to the, uh, the breakaway device. But connectors like these are awful because they allow salt and corrosion to uh, degrade the wires. And once that corrosion starts in the wires, I mean, it just spreads and spreads, but yeah, basically the wiring harness got to a point where it wouldn't allow enough current to flow in the wires, therefore it wouldn't allow all the lights to work properly and the brakes not to function properly. So replacing the wiring harness was the only option. So we've got a few more things left to do here. I have a trailer breakaway device that we need to install right here, and then we need to put a new ID bar on the back, tidy up the old wires a little bit, and then uh, we should be good. We'll give it a final test and send this trailer on its way. And now we have a little bit of hail coming down.
All right, I'm borderline hypothermic now. Freezing, soaking wet. Lights are working. That's the end of this video. Thanks for watching.